Well, can somebody say amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, you look good for a Thursday morning. Would you do that? It's good to see everybody here. Brother Jerry, thank you for allowing me this privilege and honor to be here at MIMS at the Bible Conference. Uh, Brother Jerry and I, as he said, uh, we've been friends a long time, Julie and uh, Luke and Keeley, and we just thank the Lord for them. And, and uh, this preacher excluded, let me say that again, this preacher excluded, you're going to hear some of the greatest preachers in the whole world at this conference. But your pastor is right there on the top. Amen. Amen. I never heard Brother Jerry preach that I wasn't challenged, I didn't learn something, and the Lord speak to my heart. So, Brother Jerry, I love you and Julie and the kids, and, and uh, it's good to see uh, Brother Shannon and Sandra and uh, Brother Fred. It's like coming home for me in a way, and, and uh, I, I see so many people here that I've known through the years, and we thank God for you. I want you to take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to the book of Acts, chapter 4, and I'm looking forward to hearing Brother Bob. We preached... Uh, numerous times in conferences together, and I'm always excited to hear him, so I'm going to be as brief as possible, and we can hear the man of God come and preach to us, and I know you're excited about that, and hearing Dr. David Allen at lunch. Acts chapter 4, and I'm going to read just one verse to begin with, but we'll look at several verses through the course of this message. I brought me some Welch's grape uh, jelly, and I, I want you to remind me if I forget to tell you what that's about. Are y'all still with me? If you are, say Amen. You know, really, we have complicated this thing of the Christian life, right or wrong. Really, we have complicated it. You know, what happened to the day when somebody just get born again, full of the Holy Ghost, love Jesus, win souls, and everybody's happy? Come on, somebody help me now. But now we've so complicated this. You know, it reminds me of a story. Uh, years ago, our federal government, and this is a true story. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is a true story. Uh, our federal government sent out a questionnaire across our country. It had, uh, it had 10 questions on it. They sent it to 5,000 families. Now, this is a true story. One of the questions on that questionnaire was this. How do you sit in the bathtub? 4,999 people wrote back and said, we sit in the bathtub with our back to the wall facing the faucet. One family from Tennessee wrote back and said, we sit in the bathtub with our back to the faucet facing the wall. It blew Congress' mind. They flew two congressmen down from D.C. to Tennessee. They got in a car. They drove to the family farm. They knocked on the door. The farmer came to the door and said, can I help you gentlemen? said, yes, you fit out our questionnaire and you're the only family in our nation that we surveyed that said you sit in the bathtub with your back to the wall facing, uh, back to the uh, faucet facing the wall, and we have to know why. And the farmer got this funny look on his face and said, that's easy. We lost the plug. Now listen, this isn't complicated, folks. Can I hear an amen this morning? Acts 4.13. Now when they saw the boldness, the outspokenness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. We live in a dark and a demonic and a depraved world. But it wasn't unlike the world that our brothers and sisters lived in in the first century. And if we're going to make an impact on this world, on our nation, on our state, we've got to make the same determination as these men and women did in the book of Acts. Can I hear an amen right there? Now I want to kind of take this backwards, then we'll go forwards. In Acts 17, 6, the Bible says they turned the world upside down. In Acts 15, 26, the Bible says they risked their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 5 and 28, the Bible says they filled the entire city with their teaching, with their doctrine. In Acts 4 20, it says they couldn't help but speak of the things they had seen and heard. Now let's go from the uh, first verse to the last. 
These folks were so full of the Holy Spirit, they couldn't help but speak and talk about Jesus. Come on, say amen right there. Because of that, they filled the whole city with their doctrine. And because of that, they were willing, because they believed this gospel so adamantly, to lay down their life for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have to give out six flags tickets to get folks to come to church in America. Come on, amen. I was preaching in far eastern Kenya many years ago, close to the Somalia border. Matter of fact, Julie Chaddock was on this trip with us. We were in the area of Samburu. During that time, the Somalians, uh, El Shabaab, had come into Kenya. And the church that I was to preach in just a few days later, they came in and shot in cold blood and killed 11 men in that church. It was the church under the tree. They had pews that they built under this big tree. Well, we, were, we had a 15-passenger van. We were bringing kids out of the jungle 40 and 50 at a time. You can't own a gun in Kenya, but the, the army was giving, them, giving men guns uh, uh, and saying, protect your family. We can't be everywhere. It was a mess. When I got there the next Sunday, there were men there that still had stitches in their bodies from the bullet wounds. The next Sunday after I left, they came back and shot two little kids and shot the pastor's mother. Thank God she lived. Now, I want to ask you something. How many folks would show up in our churches on a Sunday morning in the United States of America if they knew they might not even make it home? These people believe the gospel so much, they couldn't help but talk about it. Listen, they were filling the whole city with their teaching. They risked their lives for Jesus. <laughs> hey, listen. I don't know you and you don't know me, but just let me tell you this. Don't come up to me after one of these conferences, and I don't believe it's going to happen here. After what I saw last night, man, nobody was in a hurry. Everybody was eating up the preaching. I mean, I was so blessed last night. But please don't come up to me. I've been all over the world. I've seen little ladies sit on a banana leaf for three hours begging you to preach longer out in the jungle in India. Listen, I know people that have been killed. One of our Bible college students was recently martyred. And I want to tell don't come up to me and say, man, the preaching was too long. The music was too loud. The building was too hot. The building was too cold. The seats were too hot. I will go redneck on you. Come on, amen. And if that doesn't work, I'll go hood on you. Can I hear an amen from somebody? We need revival. The Bible says they turned the world upside down. We need to be reminded of verses like Acts 1-8, but you shall receive power. Dunamis power, dynamite power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Acts 4.31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. When's the last time you've been in a prayer meeting? And the building shook. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. These people, these men and women, walked under an open heaven. They walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. And they understood that through Jesus Christ, listen, the world can be changed. Come on, amen. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying today? How can you be people like that? Listen to me. We could be people like that. These folks had unbelievable courage. The Bible says when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Did anybody see that? Boldness. We're scared of our own shadow. The boldness of Peter and John. They were bold. God uses men and women who live for Jesus no matter what the consequence. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter of faith, the hall of faith, we read about men and women. Some were delivered and some were not. But the commonality among all these men and women is they were going to live for Jesus no matter what it cost them. Peter Cartwright was an evangelist during the days of Andrew Jackson when he was the president of our nation. One day when Peter Cartwright was about to preach, someone came to him and said, our president here is here. President Jackson's here. Please don't say anything that would offend him. Peter Cartwright got up and said this. I understand that our esteemed president is here tonight. And I just want to tell President Jackson, unless he repents of his sin and gives his life to Jesus, he's going to burn in hell. After the service, President Jackson came to Peter Cartwright and said, I don't know who you are or anything about you, but if I had a hundred men like you, I could take the world. They were bold. They also believed God. Acts 
27, 25, Paul said, I believe God. Say that out loud with me. I believe God. Leonard Ravenhill said one day, somebody's going to pick up a Bible and read it and believe it and embarrass the rest of us. I believe God. Thinking about little David when he went out to take sandwiches to his brother on the battlefield. And there's that big giant Goliath. They said, man, he's too big to hit. David said, no, he's too big to miss. He went down to a running brook, which is a picture and a type of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. He got five smooth stones, five the number of grace. He got his little sling out after he had shucked that armor that he hadn't proven before. He said, God's, God's used this. God's proven this. He's delivered me from the lion and the bear. Somebody said, why did he get five stones? There was only one giant. He had four brothers. Are you listening to what I'm saying? David was ready. He had that little rock in that sling. He hit, that, he hit Goliath between the eyes, killed him graveyard dead, took his own sword off, a Goliath, Goliath sword off, chopped his head off, and it was a great thing. He believed God. There's a lot of people I want to meet when I get to heaven. There's three guys I want to meet real quick. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those were three bad dudes right there, Brother Bob. I wish these young people were here this morning. But I want to say it to the adults. What if we were all marched out into a field? There was this big idol at the end of the field. And we were instructed, if you don't bow your knee when they blow the trumpet, we're going to kill you. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't bow. Remember what they said? Our God's able to deliver, but even if he doesn't, we're not bowing down to your idol. Well, they threw him in that furnace seven times hotter than before. The guy that even threw him in was incinerated. It was so hot. But they looked in there, and they were walking around with Jesus. I said they were walking around with Jesus. And when they came out, there wasn't a hair seized on their head. You couldn't even smell smoke on their garment. You can't go in a convenience store in Texas and come out like that. You'll smell like 11 packs of Kelmer non-filters. Can I hear an amen? They were people of unbelievable courage. God, give us courage. God, give us courage in this conference this week. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. But also they were people with unquestioned authority. They perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. And they marveled. Now these people were not illiterate. They would just not been trained in the schools of the rabbis. Now, the Bible's not telling us not to be trained and not to study. Uh, one revival, a lady stood up and she said, I praise God for my ignorance and I, I pray make me more ignorant and more ignorant. And a lady stood up on the other side and said, well, he answered that prayer quickly, didn't he? <laughs> Where did these men get their authority? Well, they got their authority because they lived their life based on the Bible. Isn't that a novel idea? Read the Bible. Do what it says. Read the Bible. Do what it says. Can I hear an amen? Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will endure forever. These people not only had their lives based on the Bible, they were centered on Jesus. They talked about Jesus all the time. Read the book of Acts. Talked about Jesus all the time. We don't even talk about Jesus much in our homes, much less in the streets. They were centered on Jesus. It was all about Jesus. It was about Jesus getting glory. It was about Jesus being magnified. It was about Jesus being, come on, somebody help me right here. <laughs> I was preaching in a youth meeting. It was probably about 1,500 kids, and it was just uh, like a three or four. I mean, God moved in a powerful way. Over 100 young people came to Jesus, and when I got ready to leave, I was walking off the platform after the last service. Four young ladies came up to me and said, excuse me, sir, can we talk to you a moment? And I said, I said, sure. They said, we, we weren't planning on coming, but some kids in our school invited us to, we, we didn't know anything about a, uh, a retreat or anything at a church. But we came and we heard what you were talking about and, and something happened to us and we realized what you were preaching was true and, and all four of us had given our life to Jesus. They showed me the needle marks in their arms. They, they had been drug addicts. They, they showed me the gang tattoos on their hands. 
They told me that they had been prostituting their bodies. And here's what they said. They said, hey, we don't want to do drugs anymore. And we don't want to be in the gangs anymore. And, and we don't want to prostitute ourselves anymore. We want to live for Jesus. And we want to go home and tell our friends about Jesus. And then they said, by the way, what's your name? I said, it doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> it's about Jesus. But these people also were saturated with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> they were saturated with the Spirit. Read the book of Acts. It's not the acts of the apostles. It's the acts of the Holy Spirit. They were saturated. They were full of the Holy Spirit of God. These people had unbelievable courage. These people had unquestioned authority. These people had unquenchable fire. you heard preachers say this before. But you know, if we get on fire, folks will come watch us burn. Come on, amen. I know y'all heard the old story about the church building caught on fire. They call the pastor. He's down there at 2 o'clock in the morning with his bathrobe and his slippers on watching the building burn to the ground. He looks to his right and there's the town drunk. And he goes, what are you doing here? You never come to church. He said, church never been on fire before. Come on, amen. How do we get the fire of God? Number one, from propagating the gospel. Now, I want to tell you something. Here's, here's something that's hard for me to believe. Brother Jerry's hard for me to believe. Billy Graham said only one out of 100 church members ever shares their faith. I, I, I don't understand that. Now, I, I thank God for every program we've ever had to help people, to encourage people, to share their faith. But we should not have to have a program. If you're saved, you've got a story. If you're in a burning building and somebody snatched you out of that building and brought you to safety, you wouldn't have to go to a six-week study course to tell the story. I was a high school football player. I went to church. My mom was a Sunday school teacher. My dad was a deacon. I was lost as a golf ball in last year's weeds, man. I didn't know Jesus from anything. I was religious. I went through the motions. I was trying to play both sides of the fence. But one night on a Tuesday night, I went to a revival service. A man of God got up, opened the Bible, told me that Jesus loved me, shed his blood on the cross, went to a grave, rose again from the dead, and the Spirit of God convicted me of sin. I got on my knees. I repented of my sin. I gave my life to Jesus. Nobody has to teach me to tell that story. I was there when it happened. Is it all right if I get a little excited about it? We can pray, we can preach, we can sing, we can give, but there'll be no real power unless we're going forth with the gospel. You know what bothers me about a lot of churches? Not this church, but you know what bothers me about a lot of churches? A pastor could go a year and never win a soul to Christ and nobody say anything, but if he missed going to the hospitals in three weeks, they'd fire him. Where's this power come from? This fire come from? It comes from praising God. Acts 2, 47, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. Acts 16, 25, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Do you remember that story? Paul and Silas got thrown in prison. It was midnight. Their backs were ripped open because they had been beaten with a whip. They're in the dungeon. There's probably open sewage running through their cell. They're hungry, they're hurting, they're cold, and they start singing gloom, despair, and agony on me. No, they begin to praise God and pray. And something happened. An earthquake hit that place, Brother Martin. It shook that prison. The doors flew open. Everybody's chains fell off. The jailer was going to kill himself. Paul said, get this, we kind of look over this. Paul said, don't harm yourself, sir. We, we are all here. Now, let me just give you my opinion. I 
believe everybody in the jail got saved. You say, why do you say that? If I was in prison and my cell door flew open and my chains fell off, I'd be like the Duck Dynasty boys. He gone. Hey, you're not going to influence this world by being an old grumpy negative person. Most Baptists I meet, they got a face along, they eat corn out of a gallon bucket and never, never, never bend over. Their face is so long. Come on in and just... My socket really acts out of joint. My gas is high. My, my, oh, Lord, God, help us, Jesus. Where does this authority come from? This fire come from? Praying to the Father. Acts 4, 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. E.M. Bound says, men of prayer are God's methods, and while the church is looking for a better method, God's looking for a better man. But you know the big thing? Listen. These people had unbelievable courage. They had unquestioned authority. They had unquenchable fire. Why? Because they were a people that had an unbelievable God. It's all about him. Can I hear an amen right there? Because the last part of that verse says this, and they realized they had been with Jesus. They interviewed a, a pastor over in a third world nation. And they said, man, how in the world do you do so much with so little? You have so little resources, yet you ought to reach so many people. He said, well, in America, y'all have buildings and budgets and y'all have all these programs. He said, all we have is the Holy Spirit. We are so grieved the Holy Spirit. Can I hear an amen or not? Hey, listen, folks are hurting. Folks are in bondage. Folks need Jesus, man. And they need to see the power of God. Uh, I was in Uganda, about 30 miles out in the jungle. And this might stretch some of us. I was about 30 miles out in the jungle. When I got to the village, there was a 15-year-old boy. He was chained to a tree like an animal. He was eaten out of a dog bowl, growling like a bear. Naked, had parasites all over him, full of demons. Like a long story short, we prayed over him. He got delivered, got saved. And when we left that village, he was sitting at a table with us in his right mind, fully clothed, having a conversation until this day, he's serving the Lord Jesus in his local church. You say, Bill, you've been all over the world, man, but we don't have that in America. Oh, yes, we do. People may not crawl on the floor and foam at the mouth. They'll just put a suit on and come to church and work their way into that church and cause all kind of hell. They're just as full of the debt. Come on, somebody say amen right there. And you know what? The reason all of this takes place is to get men and women to Jesus. Can I ask you a question this morning? When's the last time you want a soul to Christ? I love Bible conferences. I was so challenged last night. I was so stirred. Brother Mike was talking about taking a risk. Brother Jerry said we went to Pakistan. I didn't know what was going to happen. I stood in front of thousands of Muslims every night. I never felt so big, so American, and so slow in all my life. I had a bodyguard named Samson. Isn't that good? Amen. And he's about that tall. But he did have a sawed-off shotgun. Hallelujah. Thousands of Muslims came to Christ. Somebody said before I left, you're crazy. What if they kill you? Heaven. Heaven. Hey, we spend more time praying for the sick to keep them out of heaven than praying for souls to get them into heaven. When's the last time you wept over a soul? When's the last time you wept over the condition? Listen, we can sit around and, and shoot in the darkness and curse the darkness, but when's the last time you, you went out and you were a bright light? My wife and I were traveling. About 1 o'clock in the morning, we stopped to get some fuel. and I went to this little convenience store to get us something to drink. And 
I was the only person there, but in just about 30 seconds, it seemed like there was 10 or 15 guys that came in. Man, you could smell the, the, the marijuana on them, and man, they were cursing, and I think that it might have been gang-related. It got real tense in there, and I was standing in line to pay for uh, our soft drinks, and the guy in front of me knew the guy walked in the door, and the guy walked in the door said, hey, what are you doing here? And the guy in front of me said this, I'm just looking for some mercy. I said, Merry Christmas. I said, excuse me, sir, I know where you can find it. On a cross over 2,000 years ago where Jesus died. And I want to tell you, the whole atmosphere of that, of that convenience store changed. Let me close so Brother Bob can come. It was the first Gulf War. Colonel William Post was in charge of all of the supplies they were sent to the men and women that had been deployed in that region. While they were in the middle of the battle, Colonel Post got an email from his superiors. We're missing 40 crates of grape jelly. We must find them. Colonel Post was busy. He didn't respond quickly to the email. He got another email. Have you found the 40 crates of grape jelly? We must find them. Colonel Post sat down and here's what he wrote in his email. He said, dear sir, I got your first email and I've received your second email. We have not found the grape jelly. We can either find grape jelly or we can capture Saddam Hussein, but we can't do both. I'm afraid the church is looking for grape jelly. While the world's going to hell. There's not a one of us in this room today that doesn't need a fresh filling of the Holy Ghost to God. Where's our fire? You let somebody get on fire for Jesus in a local church these days, well, he must be called to preach. He might just be living a Christian life. Where's the courage? Where's the authority in our lives? Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I concur with the two men of God that preached last night. I believe in the rapture of the church. I believe one day old Gabriel's horn's going to toot and we're going to scoot. Come on, amen, we're going to get out of here. And I don't believe it's very long until Jesus comes. we gotta, we got to get busy. we got to get serious. Can I hear an amen? I was with a pastor not long ago. He said, I pray that aluminum goes up to $400 an ounce so these daddies can't buy their kids these bats anymore and play this travel ball and get their kids and families back in the house of God. We're more concerned about Johnny making the team than making the kingdom. We're looking for grape jelly. We want to come and be entertained, and we want the preacher to be on, and we want the choir to be on, and if they're not, we'll go find us another church. God help us. We need revival. We need the Spirit of God to fall fresh on us. Come on, amen. When I was a kid, we used to sing, breathe on me, breathe on me. Sing it with me. Holy Spirit, breathe on me. Take thou my heart, cleanse every part. Holy Spirit, breathe on me. Brother Jerry, can I just leave this grape jelly here? You know what would be good if all of us would go out and get us a bottle of grape jelly, put it in a prominent place in our home, and remind us it's too late to look for jelly. We've got to get folks to Jesus. God bless you.